So, Greg, a warm welcome for you. Mm. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Get the feedback working there. Sounds like a Jimi Hendrix song. You guys don't know who that is. I know. Um, <laughs> First of all, I want to uh, thank Bob Rich and, and, and all the folks at UCF, um, Robin Knight and the Dean and, and Tim and everybody for bringing me back and allowing me to do this. Um, I can't think of anything more important than getting a, a chance to talk to you, to students, because guess what I'm doing? I'm talking to the future, right? I was you not too long ago, well, 35 years ago, wasn't too long ago, um, but I'm talking to the future. So it's huge. So it's an honor for me and a, and a privilege, and, and I want to thank you for coming, sort of, because the last bullet on that last slide said that the 30th of November session was mandatory. I kind of have a feeling this one was mandatory too. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff today, but I want to start by talking about technology. And I want to I tell all of you that you're in the right place. So I was supposed to come yesterday, and Bob was wonderful, and he set up a bunch of meetings for me and things. And I get on a flight, United Airlines, Dulles Airport, Washington, D.C. About three-fourths of the flights out of there are, are on United. And uh, we go out to the runway to take off, and we sat there for an hour. And they came back and they said, you know, usually it's a, a mechanical problem or, you know, something. Problem with the air traffic control system. No, yesterday it was a problem with the unimatic computer system. Unimatic. That sounds like something with tubes, right? Um, a problem with the unimatic computer system, and we're going to sit out here for half an hour while the IT guys try to fix it and go to a backup system. And if that doesn't work, we're going to go back to the gate. And, and they'll try something else. Well, guess what? We sat out there for 30 minutes. That didn't work. We went back to the gate. Uh, they took us off the airplane. They put us back in the airport. And they said, just hang around. And we'll let you know when we get the Unimatic computer system fixed. And I said, well, what's the Unimatic computer system do? Oh, it just, you know, it, it's kind of a back office system. You know, it handles the, the flight plans and the, and the timing and the load distribution on the aircraft, just stuff like that. And I said, you got like this single point of failure in the system. Right? It was, this was global. This was worldwide. This one system was down, and it, it took United Airlines down worldwide yesterday for about two hours. And so I'm walking off the airplane, and of course, all these people are grousing. And there was a lady sitting about two rows behind me, and she was kind of loud and kind of unhappy. And she was, we were sitting on the tarmac at Dulles in Washington, D.C., and she's going, I'm looking at my travel app here. I'm looking at my travel tracker app here, and it says we're over Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're going to be in Orlando in an hour. And so I'm sitting on the airplane thinking we've got a computer back at United somewhere that was really important that's not working. And oh, by the way, all the apps and all the stuff on the internet's kind of giving everybody wrong information. So the, the point is, the systems are really fragile, right? They're really fragile. And you guys are in the right place because you guys are the ones that are going to help design systems that aren't so fragile in the future going forward. So I'm getting off the airplane, and they're all grousing, and everybody's kind of unhappy and angry, and people are mad because they're inconvenienced. And, Somebody said to me, well, what should they do? And I, you know, I was just some guy on the airplane. I said, well, probably the first thing they ought to do is, you know, quit putting the IT guys in the basement in dirty cubicles and treating them badly, you know, because those are the guys that were fixing their system and trying to get it to work. So that was my adventure yesterday. That's not what I came here to talk about, though, but it's kind of an interesting vignette, and, and I want to, do want to talk about some things that have to do with job security and your future and stuff like that. So it, it sort of applies. So what I want to do today is for about 30 minutes, and I've got some PowerPoint slides here, and I'm going to blow through them pretty quick, but according to Tim, you guys get to keep them and look at them if you want. And you can call me and ask me questions about them if you want. Um, but I'm going to take you sort of on a journey on what I've been doing and, and how I got where I am and, and what's been going on for the last 35 years. And so this is all of it on one slide. Here's a timeline of basically my career um, from when I started life in college, just like you guys, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And I spent the, the first 20 years in the Air Force. But in the Air Force, I didn't fly, I did technology. And it was in the Air Force when I got to come here. They sent me here. And then I went into industry for the next five years or so. And I was doing great in industry and having a great time and learning about being a businessman and all that. And I got this call from the United States Senate. And they wanted to know if I would come and be their CIO. So I did that for five years. And then after doing that for five years and, and getting accomplished what we kind of wanted to accomplish, I went back into industry. And that's where I am now. Um, and I'm running about half of a company. It's a publicly traded company called NCI. And we do technology, and we do technology for the federal government. So I'll end up today talking about some of the challenges around that. So a lot of things have been going on for the last 35 years. And oh, by the way, when I finished UCF, I also started teaching. That's what that line on the top is. I decided to try to keep myself current and, and keep myself involved in academics and involved with students. And, and as I was getting older, they were still younger. And, 
and, and to try to, you know, to continue to keep my skills up. So I began teaching graduate school. So in the background, while all this other stuff was going on, I've been teaching grad school for George Washington University, the University of Maryland, and the University of Maryland University College, or UMUC. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through this timeline, but I'm gonna just talk about highlights and some of the things that happened to me and some of the things I learned along the way about leadership and about innovation. Here's where I started. It's called the Blue Zoo. It's the Air Force Academy. It's not really a college, right? So it says, this is college, I don't think so. It's not college, it's a leadership lab is what it is. And I was gonna go to the University of Florida I had my room picked out, I had my roommate picked out, and I thought that was gonna be great, I'm gonna go be a gator like my brother. And um, I got this telegram in the mail one day that said you've been accepted to the Air Force Academy. Of course, my parents were delighted. I said, I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the University of Florida where they don't wear any clothes and I'm gonna have a good time learning stuff. <laughs> and um, they said, no, you're gonna go there. Um, and so anyway, I went to the Air Force Academy and it's, it's a leadership lab, and so what did I learn there? Um, I learned some really interesting and really valuable stuff, and my wife will tell me um, that, that I probably learned, you know, a, a lot of the things that make me the way I am there. Primarily discipline, right? Um, you know, if, if, if you've got to do things in a certain timetable and you've got to do 15 things but you only have time to do seven, then you've got to figure out what's important and what's not important. We used to call that figuring out what to kiss off and what not to kiss off. If you could successfully figure out what you could kiss off today, you know, and maybe make up for tomorrow and jam all the other stuff in that's important, um, you, know, you could get along. I learned the power of planning there. Um, you know, there was more stuff that, than you could do that you had to do, so you had to plan, you had to figure it out. Um, I got a taste of leadership there. So the Air Force Academy is not like college. Um, you're, in, you're in a cadet wing, an Air Force cadet wing, so you're a cadet and you have a rank, and as you move up through the ranks, you have responsibilities and, and you're responsible for your classmates and you're responsible for leadership and things like that among your peers. So I got to learn a little bit about leadership there. Um, and finally, I'm jumping back up here. I learned a really valuable lesson about survival there and that was that you have to have a sense of humor. So that, you know, they would torment us during the day and then we would, <laughs> we would go to bed at night, they'd close the doors, we'd go to bed at night and we'd lay in our, our beds and just laugh about all the crazy stuff that had been going on. So if, if, if you could develop a sense of humor, you can get through just about anything I found out at the Air Force Academy. Finally, um, that, that's me in that picture standing on that box, um, ba basically working a, a thing we called the assault course, and it was a summer program, and we brought people in and we ran them through a simulated war situation to get them, it was a summer thing to get them kind of a taste of what it's like to be in the military and to be in combat. I really liked that. I really enjoyed that. So my senior year, I was getting ready to go fly jets like everybody in the Air Force wants to do. I was gonna be a fighter jock like all the Air Force guys wanna do. And they figured out I had no depth perception. And I'm like, well, what's the point? I need depth perception to fly jets. And they said, yes, you need to know where the end of the runway is. I said, okay. They said, well, you can do these other things. And they said, you can be a logistician or you can be a security policeman or you can be a, a weapons controller. And I'm like, oh my God, yawn. You can be a communicator. I said, I think I'll join the Marine Corps because I want to do that. That'll be fun. I called my father. I told my father, who was a career Air Force guy in communications, and I said, Dad, I'm, I said, I'm not going to be flying jets like I wanted to, so I think I'll join the Marine Corps and the Air Force Academy and will let me do that, and the Marines will take me. He said, no, we got to rethink that. He said, what are they offering you? And I told him what they were offering me. He said, take technology, take communications. He said, you know, it's the future. Technology is the future. Try that. He said it was good to me in the Air Force. Try that. So another lesson I learned there was take advice, take good advice from people who care about you, from people who love you. And that's something that stood me well, and I made a really good decision that day when I decided not to go into the Marines and to go into technology instead. So off from the Air Force Academy, I went to become an Air Force technology guy. I had no idea what that was going to be about. I went to basic comm electronics school down in Biloxi, Mississippi at Keesler Air Force Base. And it was a whole school about you know, circuits and radios and telephones because that's what communications technology was in 1977. It was radios and telephones. Computers were these things that the finance people had and they were running COBOL programs and I didn't know from that. So I was down there at Basic Comm Electronics School and one day during one module of one class, there was one one hour block dedicated to something called combat crew communications. And the instructor got up in front of us and he said, this is about combat crew communications, he said, but there's only 100 of those in the Air Force, and none of you guys are gonna get to go do that, so we'll just skip this, and you guys can be dismissed early. So we all went, woohoo, and out the door we went. Well, I finished comm electronics school eight months later, got my orders for my first assignment, and guess what I was? A combat crew communications officer at a bomb wing in northern Maine. 
wow, what's, what's that? I, I had no idea. I got up there, and I'm a second lieutenant, a pretty young one, actually. I was 21. I, just, I was one of the younger kids in my class at the academy. So at 21, I got up there. At 22, at 22, I was responsible for the nuclear mission, the communications around the nuclear mission for a wing of B-52 bombers and KC-135 tankers during the Cold War that had, the, that had the mission to go fight the Cold War. And you guys know what that is, and, and it was highly classified, so I can't really go into it much. But the point is, 22 years old, Right out of college, this was the leadership experience they gave me. This was the level of responsibility they gave me. I had a higher security clearance at age 22 and more operational, real operational responsibility than I've ever had since in my entire career, ever, at, at age 22. And I had a, a team of eight enlisted folks that worked with me. And one of the first lessons I learned there, it was back to that taking advice again, uh, I had a master sergeant, and he came up and he put his arm around my shoulder one day when I first got there, and he was, you know, a, a senior enlisted man. And he said, Greg, I want to give you a little advice. Well, he didn't say Greg. He said, LT, lieutenant, I want to give you a little advice. And I said, what's that, sergeant? And he goes, just sit over here, watch what we do, don't mess with us, let us do our job, and you'll be okay. He said, if you mess with us and, and don't let us do our job, we won't be okay. So I took that advice, and those guys did their job, and we were okay. It worked out well, and I learned a lot, but... What a great leadership opportunity right out of the box. So the point is, you never know, you know what you're going to get thrown at you and when. Finally, the last thing, um, well, this is an interesting picture. One of the things, this is me, one of the things I had to do there as a, as a sidebar was I had to deploy, um, in, the, in the event of a nuclear war, I had to deploy to some site and set up an, an HF radio site um, where we could bring you know, the airplanes back, coming back from their missions. So a, a little sidebar, and that's a picture of me out in the field practicing setting up HF radio antennas somewhere in the woods, somewhere in the United States. But I got some really good advice there as I was leaving that. It was a tough assignment. Um, I was tired. I was a little demotivated, and I was in the, um, the commissary. And in the military, the commissary is the grocery store. And I'm in the commissary, and my commander was in there. And uh, he, he, saw, he saw I was tired and a little downhearted, and he said, you know, what's up, Greg? He said, you don't look like you're too happy. And I said, yeah, you know, I said, sir, I said, I said, if this is what the Air Force is going to be like, you know, for the next 18 years, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm in the right thing. And he said, you know what, let me give you some advice. He said, do the best you can here in this job, and that's the surest path to success, because that'll get you to your next job. And I think that's some of the best advice I've ever gotten in my life. You know, if, if what you're doing now is worthwhile, be successful at it. Do your best. Excel at it. And, and that'll get you to the next step. And I think that's the key to upward mobility. And it was great advice. Well, while I was there, I found out that the Air Force has some opportunities. They have the opportunities, you have the opportunities in the Air Force to go get graduate education. Pretty cool. So I thought, I'd like to go try that. I'd like to go do something else. And I learned I had a little control over my destiny. So I applied for a program called the um, Air Force Institute of Technology. And they said, yeah, you can come and do this. And they said, um, come to the schoolhouse at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, to the School of Engineering, and you can get a degree in information technology. I was a communicator, right? Back then it was radios and telephones. This was a chance to go learn about computers. It was 1979. It was a pretty cool time to go learn about computers. You know, um, th things like databases were just happening. You know, operating systems were becoming more mature. PCs were showing up. Um, it was a great time to go to school. So I went there, sponsored by the Air Force, and I got a master's degree in information technology and, and finally, you know, became an engineer. And, and it, what I learned during that experience was I learned the value of engineering discipline. And I learned the value of communications, you know, the ability to communicate well, the ability to defend a thesis. And, and I, would, I would say to all of you, I think it's really important um, in graduate education that you do a thesis and that you do a meaningful thesis. So you could do a couple of kinds of theses there at AFIT. You could, you could do a, what was called a survey thesis if you wanted to, and you could kind of do a, a study of the state of the art of the, of the literature, and you could write a thesis. But the other thing you could do on that base was you could go down the hill to the labs where real stuff was happening. So I went down the hill and I found a lab where they were working on avionics for KC-135s. KC-135s are the big tankers that they use, so I told you I had B-52s and KC-135s. Well, the B-52s drop the bombs and launch the missiles. The KC-135s carry the gas and refuel them in midair. That's the only way to get big birds like that to their targets. So they were working on avionics for KC-135s. I went down the hill to the lab and I found a guy who needed some work done around building a simulation model for an avionics hot bench for these KC-135s. And that's what I did my thesis on. So when it came time to defend, 
in, in addition to my faculty and my committee that was there, and this was for a master's thesis, I had my customer there. I had the guy who ran the lab, and he said, you know what? We're using Greg's work. We're using it on the KC-135s. We're going to use his simulation model to build the avionics hot bench, and we're going to save the Air Force money, and it's going to be something we use in the Air Force. And so if you get an opportunity to do something that's real and that's useful and, and to apply your engineering knowledge and your engineering discipline, as opposed to just filling squares, right? Um, you know, take it, jump on it. I learned here that success is 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. I know you guys have all heard that before. It's true. And I know you guys are experiencing it here. Um, engineering's an ordeal, right? My son just graduated, my son graduated engineering in Virginia, at Virginia Tech in 2008. Uh, he's a computer engineer out of Virginia Tech. And he used to call me about once every other week and it would be, Dad, I can't, I can't deal, I can't do this anymore. I can't get through this. And I would say, son, it's, a, it's an ordeal, work hard, endure, get help, you know, things you don't understand, work together with your classmates, make friends, and get through it. I said, it'll pay off. And it did. He graduated. He graduated in June. He went to work in July, um, and he started at about $75,000 a year. So it, it's worth doing, um, and it's hard. It's 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. Cooperate and graduate. When I went there, I was a radio and, and telephone guy. I knew about putting up HF antennas in the woods, but I didn't know squat about information technology. I was starting from scratch, and I needed help. I needed a lot of help. So I made friends. I figured out what I didn't know. We worked in groups, and I learned from them, and they learned from me, and we worked on projects together, and they did the parts that I couldn't do, and I did the parts that they couldn't do. So cooperate and graduate. I think it's a life lesson um, that I would share. So. I'm a captain in the Air Force now, I've got my master's degree, the Air Force has invested in me, and they sent me um, to Langley Air Force Base to work on a project. And so now I'm getting to use my education, I'm getting to use my engineering discipline to work on a project, and I'm running an engineering branch, working on something called a tactical battle management system, and I know that sounds like a big bunch of gobbledygook, and I'm there, and the day in, day out grind is, you know, you're coding, you're testing, it's the, the software development life cycle, you're coming to an office, you know, in a building, and you're, you're still in the military, but you're working in technology. Um, I didn't know how important the work was that I was doing at the time, because the system we were building was the one they used in Desert Storm to build all the air tasking orders, or all the packages that they used to put together groups of aircraft to go attack, and it's, it, the, it was the beginnings of the system they still use. So you don't really know sometimes how important what you're doing is. You may be doing something right now um, turns out is really important. You just don't know, so it, it's worth putting your effort into it. I found out that, that in the Air Force they do have a culture of innovation and technology excellence. Um, it's, it was a good place to be uh, if you wanted to be in technology, engineering. They, they were interested in that, and I got to apply my skills there and use the things that I learned. And while I was there, I sort of got the itch to go back to school and learn more about information technology, I thought. So I started getting ready for what I call, I call it getting ready for my next gig, um, and, and it falls under the be careful what you wish for column, because I found out that this program, AFIT, that I told you about that sent me to get a master's degree, would also send people to get PhDs. And I went home one night and I said to my wife, Linda, I said, uh, Air Force will send two people out of the whole Air Force to get a PhD in computer science. What do you think? And she said, be careful what you wish for. And I said, why? And she goes, because you might get picked. And I said, no. I said, I'll never get picked for that. I mean, I struggle to get my information technology masters. I'm doing good here. I said, I'm just going to try, just, just for the heck of it. I'll just try. I'll just apply and see what happens. Well, I applied, and here's what happened. I got picked. And they said, they said, we don't have a PhD in computer science at the Air Force Institute of Technology in Wright, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where I got my master's degree. So the, the School of Engineering there didn't have a PhD in computer science. It was 1983. A lot of schools didn't have a PhD in computer science. So the Air Force said, Greg, we'll send you. We'll pay your way. We'll pay your salary while you're there. You pick your school. Go anywhere you want. You can go to MIT. You can go to Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. You can go wherever you want. So I started thinking about it, and I applied to some of those places, University of Texas at Austin. And I started talking to my wife, and I said, you know, my, I had a lot of family in Florida. My grandparents were in Clearwater. My brother's in Panama City. My aunt and uncle live over in Leesburg um, in the center of the state, not too far from here. So I thought, you know, Florida. I, I, I love Florida. 
And, and I said to my wife, she's a Virginia girl, I said, how about we look at schools in Florida? Because maybe we want to go there and live someday. And she said, okay. So I started looking at schools in Florida, and I found out that the University of Florida didn't have a PhD in computer science. But I found out that there was a school in Central Florida called the University of Central Florida that did. And I thought, that'll be great. That's near Disney World. <laughs> and they don't wear lots of clothes there. And I got cheated when I didn't get to go to the University of Florida, so I'm going to go to UCF and go get me a PhD in computer science. I'm going to go down there and get me a PhD in computer science. And I was pretty full of myself. Well, remember I told you the Air Force said they would send me and they would pay my way and they would pay my salary? That's a sweet deal, right? Full-time student, I don't have to worry about paying for it. There was a rub. Here's the rub. The rub was, Captain Hansen, you go to school for three years and that's it. And if you don't get a PhD in three years, you're done. Not, not only are you you're done there, you're done in the Air Force because after we invest all that money and you, we're not going to want you around if you don't succeed. And I said, what? PhD in three years, I ought to be able to do that. No problem with that. I'll go to UCF. There's two kinds of schools I've learned in my life. Now, maybe it's different now, but in my life, I've learned there's two kinds of schools. There's the kind of school like the Air Force Academy where I went to college the first time that's really, really hard to get into, but not too hard to get through if you obey the rules and apply yourself and use the 90%, 10% inspiration, perspiration, and cooperate and graduate. You can get through the Air Force Academy. They want you to succeed. They don't want people to leave there because they've spent a lot of money bringing people there, taxpayer money. It's one kind of school. The other kind of school I've learned is pretty easy to get into, but really hard to get through. And guess which one UCF is? <laughs> Come on down, Captain Hanson. You're an Air Force guy. We know you're going to pay your tuition. Come on down. So I come down here, and I'm sitting there in my little captain uniform, first day, getting all registered, learning about what college is like, because this is really the first time I've been to college. Air Force Academy ain't college, and the Air Force Institute of Technology at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that ain't college. So I'm in college now, and it's great. So I walked into Dr. Mukherjee's office, who was running the program at the time, Amar Mukherjee, and I sat down and I said, hey, Dr. Mukherjee, I'm Captain Greg Hansen from the United States Air Force, and I'm one of your new students, and I'm here to get a PhD in computer science. And he said, welcome. And I said, I've got to do it in three years. <laughs> and he said, what? I said, I've got to do it in three years. And he said, you'll do it when we say you're done with it. And he said, you'll get your PhD when you've done something significant and contributed to the state of the art. And oh, when you get published. I'm like, OK, I've got three years. Off I go. You know. <laughs> so I started. This turned out to be the, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life and one of the most rewarding things. Um, I learned a ton of stuff here, and I say, uh, I say in the title that it was a turning point in my career, and it was, and you'll see why in a, in a few minutes, a few more slides down the road. Um, like I said, I came here and I thought I was pretty smart and pretty cocky, and I was going to have fun at this little school in Central Florida, but, but guys like uh, Dr. Dutton and Dr. Workman and, and Ali Aruji down here in the front row, and they, they, they helped me get real and understand that you know, there, there were some things to learn and some things to do, and I learned a lot about leadership from them. And these were guys who helped me. Um, they, they cared about me, and they, were, they, they helped me, and they helped me get through this thing in addition to some good friends that I made here. So I learned a lot about leadership, and I learned a lot about innovation. Here's a picture of, uh, of Ali, Dr. Aruji, at a much younger time. We looked pretty good then, didn't we? <laughs> we looked pretty good then. We still look pretty good. Um, so I learned a lot here at the university. And here's how I succeeded. I had a lot of guidance from a wonderful faculty. I got by with a little help from my friends. I, that's, that's an old Beatles song. That, that's a, a prehistoric rock band. <laughs> then there was Joe Cocker that did it. That was still prehistoric. And no, the, the point is, you know, it's, it's back to cooperate and graduate. So I had been, you know, basically an engineering guy from the academy and an information technology guy from my master's program. But here, it was computer science. And computer science was a different animal. And when I got thrown into courses on automata theory and computational complexity and computer architecture, I was lost. And the first semester I was here, I pulled down a couple of really bad grades. And I had an instructor set me down. Well, here's how it worked. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting towards the, the end of my coursework, and I'm, I'm doing OK. And I get this letter from the Air Force. 
And this letter from the Air Force says, congratulations on your work so far, you're doing great, um, but if you don't finish your, your program, you know, you're done. So there was a little pressure there, and it was still three years, that hadn't changed. So, you know, at about a year and a half in, I had a couple of areas that I was kind of deficient in. And, you know, one of them uh, was, was a class that Dave Workman, Dr. Workman, was teaching. And uh, I went in his office and sat down, and I was making a C in his class, and it was a graduate class. And I was in a PhD program, and I said, hey, I said, this unsat. I said, I, I can't, I'm going to get thrown out of the Air Force if I don't pass this class. And he said, well, he said, Greg, he said, if you get a B, you can get a B. I, I, I was doing as well as some of the other guys in the class. He said, but if I give you a B, you're going to come up against the PhD qualifying exam, and you're not going to pass. So you might as well just, you know, take the pill now and take the class again and really learn the material. So I did, and so I had some experiences like that here. It was not smooth sailing, and it was not easy, and it was hard. But I learned a lot about engineering precision here. I learned a lot about planning and time management. Um, I was fortunate enough to end up in the front row of Dr. Arugi's class. I think it was the first class he taught, taught out of Ohio State. And I guess he saw some promise in me, and we got together and we formed a committee, a research committee, and, and what we did was we, together, we put together a plan. And my class, you know, other people who are getting PhDs here, I call them my classmates. And by the way, they're all very successful now. They're all distinguished professors at universities around the country. So they came out of UCF and they did great. Um, they used to laugh at me because, because Ollie and I would sit down and we put together a plan and we put together basically a, a critical path that I put up on my wall in my little office on the second floor of the computer science building. And oh, by the way, I love what you guys have done with that. It's got Starbucks and kiosks and all kinds of cool stuff in it now. I guess it's Seattle's best, but still, it's, it's cool now. It wasn't cool then. It was a torture chamber back then. Um, <laughs> but we put together this timeline, and, it, and it, it had every single gate that we had to hit to get me through this program in three years. Well, it turns out it, it took me three and a half years. The Air Force let me have a six-month extension, and we got through the program, and we did it in three and a half years. Um, thanks to some wonderful guidance and some mentorship from Ollie and, and from all the professors and from all the folks who helped me and from my friends who helped me. But this changed, changed my life and set me up for the rest of my career, so you'll see why as I go through the rest of this. This is kind of neat, though. My son was born here, um, so I had a little bit of, I had at least five minutes of spare time while I was working on the degree. <laughs> this is a picture of us in Japan. One of, the, one of the keys to successfully passing a dissertation defense is to get published first. Ollie taught me that. So we got published and we went to a conference in Japan. Um, I took my 21-month-old son. That's an adventure, taking a 25-hour flight with a 21-month-old in your lap. Um, uh, and here, this is interesting. This is a map of UCF. This inside the circle is the UCF I knew. Look how much you guys have grown. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. I knew the, I knew the university was going to be important when I came here, and, and it turned out, you know, you really are. So here's the rest of the story. From here... I went to the Pentagon um, to work for the Secretary of Defense. The Air Force invests in you to get a PhD. They want something back. So they sent me to the Pentagon to work for the Secretary of Defense um, doing budgeting. Basically, I was running the shop that did all of the defense budgeting for the entire Department of Defense, you know, the planning and, 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 and the data analysis on the defense budget. One of the first things I got to do was use the knowledge I learned here. I got there. Secretary of Defense had a database. They did, ran reports on the database. It turned out these reports took two or three days to run. I said, wait a minute, there's something wrong. This was an Oracle database running on a cluster of VAXs. I know that all sounds like foreign language to you, except the Oracle part. Um, you know, back then we had one gigabyte disk drives that were about the size of this podium. They were called Fujitsu Eagles, and I was really proud because I had two of those running this database, but it was huge. It was a relational database, but it wasn't performing very well. So I took what I learned here, and I got my team together, and we reverse engineered the database, and then re-engineered the database, and we took the reporting time down from days to minutes. And that was pretty cool. People liked that. So there was a chance for innovation um, in, in a job, you know, and a chance to show a little bit of leadership. In this job, I, I had experiences, and I made contacts that would endure for the rest of my life and the rest of my career. Um, I, got, I got to do research there. I got to publish there while I was in the Air Force. I got to do work in executive information systems design, um, and I got published doing that, and I got to get up and speak in front of people, and, and people began to, you know, to, to notice some of the innovation and some of the things that we were doing. And I had a great team there. I had about 55 folks there. Again, you know, none, none of this is about, about me. It's about us. It's about the group of people that, that surrounded me and helped me do the, the great things that we were able to do. And that's, that's another thing, guys. As you go through your life, as you go through your career, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and then just turn them loose and empower them to do what they need to do 
and they will do magic for you, and, and, and you'll benefit from that. A lot of innovation going on then. Um, it was kind of an interesting time. It was the early days of relational databases, decision support systems, executive information systems. And then something interesting happened. I got orders to go to Air Command and Staff College, which is a military school that I'm not going to talk about here. Um, while I was there, it was a nice year off to learn about military history and military doctrine, and I, and I loved it, and it was great. And I was looking forward to coming out of there and going back to the Pentagon so that I could establish myself in Washington, D.C. and begin planning my career, my future, after the Air Force. So I already began thinking about that. And then I got these orders to go to, the, to NATO. Now, NATO's interesting, right? So it's, it's an alliance. It's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's an alliance. And back then, it was 16 countries. Basically, it was formed after World War II. Um, it, it was put together, you know, to, to fight to fight the Cold War or, to, or to, you know, to protect us from the Cold War. And so it consisted of the countries of Europe. And I got sent over there at the end of the Cold War to an international headquarters. And I came from the Pentagon to go there. And so in the Pentagon, I had five systems on my desk. I had email. I had word processing. I had computer systems. I had 55 brilliant people working for me. And I got to this job. And my job was to write the five-year strategic plan for this Headquarters. This is a combat headquarters in the center of in the center of Europe, responsible for basically protecting Europe from you know the Russian onslaught in the event of the Cold War or World War III or whatever you want to call it. Combat headquarters, and I worked for a German colonel who worked for a Dutch general who worked for a Belgian general who worked for a German general, and then I had a couple of Air Force generals that were keeping an eye on me to make sure I was behaving myself. I worked for them too. That was the last up. But my job was to write the strategic plan for this headquarters for information technology. And guess what I found when I got there? They just, Major Hansen, welcome to your new office. I walked into my office. There was a gray steel desk and a gray steel file cabinet and a telephone. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, going back to my comm days, I recognize this device. It looks like a telephone. Where's my computer? Oh, we don't have any computers here. You're asking me to write the five-year IT strategic plan. That sounds like opportunity, right, and innovation. Yeah, go ahead and write it. But you're not going to get any money. So you write it, and we'll put it on the shelf, and then we'll find something else for you to do. You know, don't, don't take this all too seriously, you know. I'm like, where's my computer? Where's my email? Well, I, you know, there were no angry birds then, but there was nothing, right? And so I said, okay, I'm going to write a five-year strategic plan. And so I began fighting... I, I, I began operating in what I called an innovation greenfield, but I had to fight holy wars. I had to fight religious wars in the, in the innovation greenfield. So I had all these ideas about what kind of information technology I wanted to bring to this headquarters. I, really, all I wanted to do was get email and get a computer on my desk, but you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So I had all these ideas about, about this cool network I was going to build and put office automation on everybody's desk, you know, so now everybody would have a gray desk and a gray file cabinet and, oh, a computer, you know, and so they could get rid of the gray file cabinet and, and talk and use email and, and do Microsoft applications and things. But there were, there were religious wars to fight. So, you know, there were people there from other countries with other technologies that didn't like my ideas. There was this whole culture around classified. Everything was classified. Even stuff that wasn't classified was classified. And so, Greg, if you want to build a network, you can't have hard drives on those machines. And, and you, can't, you, know, you can't store information on those machines because everything's classified. And I said, no. I said, I did a study. Um, and I found out that really about 90% of the stuff that we did wasn't classified. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a network, and I'm going to wire every building in this, in this headquarters with, with a local area network, and I'm going to put a computer on everybody's desk, and we're going to build an office automation network that can actually help people get stuff done around here. And so this is what I wrote in my five-year IT strategic plan. I showed it to my boss, the German colonel, and he said, that's really nice. You'll never get that approved. Let's find something else for you to do. I said, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. So I got a staff car, and I said, I said I'm going to go up to headquarters in NATO in, in uh, Brussels, Belgium. I said, I'm going to present this and see, if, see what happens. And so I, I got in my staff car, and my driver drove me at 300 miles an hour up the Autobahn to Brussels. We got there in about 10 minutes. <laughs> I was terrified. I walk in this room about this size. It's about this size. But it has one big conference table in it, which is about the size of all these seats together. And there are the 16 data automation experts from the countries of NATO sitting around this table. And the chairman of the data automation committee for the entire alliance 
Now, th this is an alliance that's spread all over Europe, you guys got to understand, right? Bases, you know, in Turkey, in Germany, in the Netherlands, all over Europe. This is an alliance that the United States puts millions of dollars into. Th this is an alliance that's still around, by the way, and you're seeing it on the news now, right? Affiliated with what's going on in, in Southwest Asia. So it's important. So I'm sitting in this room, in this huge room, at, at one end of this huge table, and I'm this tiny little guy down there with my little five-year strategic plan, and the 16 data automation experts from these countries are all around the table, and I'm intimidated. So they said, well, tell us what you got there, Major Hansen. So I briefed my little plan, and they started asking me questions, and I started answering the questions, and I'm all excited and enthusiastic. And I, I had a major with me, and he, he was a, a, an American Army major, but he, was, he knew something about the culture there more than I did, apparently. And the guy at the other end of the table who was running the show apparently was pretty irritated with me. And so he whispered it in my ear and he says, Craig, he said, there's a protocol here. He said, when they ask you a question, you have to push a button and then a red light comes on and then they tell you you have permission to speak and then you can speak. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we, we got with the protocol. Anyway, long story short, I briefed this strategic plan and they all sat back in their seats and the guy at the end of the table said, this is the first plan we've seen in five years that makes any sense. We're going to give you $5 million, go back and build it. And so we did. So we, we went back and we built uh, the first office automation network and put, you know, put a computer on everybody's desk and a local area network in the headquarters and innovated and led and basically changed, changed things at the headquarters and made it a, a more effective place to do business. So I learned about taking chances and taking risks and I learned about leadership in a highly political arena. All these different countries, all these different ideas. And oh, by the way, they don't all get along all the time. You know that. And when I left, the German general that ran the command wrote me a letter, and he said, congratulations, <laughs> you've broken every rule in the book. He said, but you got a, you got a computer on everybody's desk. So it was really cool. The other thing I got to do is I got to help build a $200 million um, deployable automated uh, headquarters, alternate war headquarters for the command. But, but the challenge there was we were building something that was spec during the Cold War you know, at a time, you know, when the Cold War was ending. So you were, we were trying to build something for a mission that didn't really exist anymore the same way. And that was interesting because I worked in a consortium uh, with a consortium of companies, uh, the largest being Siemens Corporation. And, um, and that was also a wonderful experience to learn leadership and innovation. So uh, this was an, an incredibly valuable experience for me. Um, and I learned a little bit about politics, international politics, leadership and innovation in that environment. Well, after after that, I came back to the Pentagon and worked at the, at the Air Force headquarters um, in the air staff there, and I was the lead software engineer for the United States Air Force, and I got to represent the Air Force as, as the lead software engineer and do neat stuff. Um, one of the most important things I got to do was work this little problem we called Y2K, um, and <laughs> back then it was, a real, it was a real issue. I mean, people didn't know what was going to happen. People were panicked. People were worried. Uh, I don't know, I'll never forget the day... Um, a general called me into his office and he said, he was a big guy and a smart guy, and he was a general and I was just a lieutenant colonel, and there's a big difference. <laughs> and uh, he said, Greg, how in the world did you engineers let us get in this condition? How did you software people let this Y2K thing happen? Go fix it. <laughs> so, so I got to do that and, and, and I got to do some, some cool stuff at the headquarters Air Force, but I also got to transition out and so after 20 years in the Air Force at that point, I retired, I say 24 years because I count those four years at that non-college, the Air Force Academy. So after 24 years, I hung up the uniform and I retired um, to go into industry. And I was recruited out to a company called Telos Corporation, um, which was about a $200 million privately held company. And I went there to be their first chief technology officer. And the reason I got to go do that was because of the experiences that I had gained, because of my experience here at UCF, um, because of all the things that I had been allowed to do and all the experiences where I had been placed into situations and allowed to lead and innovate. And so it was great. And I got to go into industry and do that. And, and at Telos, I was the CTO and the CIO worked for me. So I had, I had all the CTO responsibilities. And in a technology company, the CTO is kind of the outward facing technologist, lead technologist. That's the person that is, evangelizes for the company and looks at you know, technology partnering and innovation and helping the company grow along with technology. The CIO in a technology company typically runs the information technology infrastructure. And the CIO worked for me, but as far as the CEO was concerned, I, I was the whole ball of wax. And one of the most valuable things I learned there 
was what I call Hansen's CIO CTO law. Basically, the law says this nothing any CIO or CTO or any technology person comes up with is going to be embraced by operations because it wasn't their idea. So I'm sitting down there in my technology ivory tower coming up with all these cool ideas that I'm going to lay on the company and we're going to do this stuff. And the operations guys are all like, no, wait a minute. How is that helping me make more money? How is that helping me make more profit? How is that helping me grow business? So the trick is nothing you come up with as a technology guy in that capacity is going to be embraced by the operations folks unless they see value in terms of the business. And so you have to figure out ways to get them to own it and take credit for it and take responsibility for it. So if coming up with a new corporate intranet or a new portal for doing something or some other new innovation is your idea, you've got to figure out a, a way to get the operations guys to believe it's their idea and to advocate for you, and that's how you get it done. I went to a small company from there called Unitech um, where I got to learn, um, in, in addition to being the chief technology officer, I also then really got to learn about business because I was responsible for what's called profit and loss in the business world. And so I got, I got a taste then of, you know, as the CTO, I was doing technology things, but as a guy responsible for whether or not we were making profit and the business was running well and being called in and having to report my numbers, um, I got a taste of how that responsibility feels. And so there was a, an opportunity for leadership there. And then 9-11 happened. Then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happened, they decided to start a new organization in the federal government called the TSA. And you guys all know about it, because every time you fly through an airport, you get inspected by the TSA, and you get to wait in the big line. Well, the TSA started as a couple of guys in the Department of Transportation, and um, I got the first contract to help start the TSA's IT stuff. And so I got to work with the CIO of the new TSA, and he and I worked together to basically start that whole thing from scratch. And it started with deploying the first security folks to the airports, and the way they did that was they just went through the FAA, and they tapped guys on the shoulder, and they said, you're going to Orlando, you're going to Anchorage, you're going to Seattle. And I had to set up an integration facility and build information technology kits that they could take to these airports and set up offices and begin the TSA. We did the initial queuing work on how these security lines are going to work. Um, it was a real interesting experience, and I just got shoved into that. And, and the next thing I know, I'm responsible for this stuff. So you never know when a little leadership or a little innovation opportunity is going to come along. When it does, jump on it. Go for it, because it'll lead to good places. So that's what I was doing when I got a call from the Sergeant at Arms of the United States Senate. And he said, Greg, this is a Sergeant at Arms of the United States Senate. And I said, am I being arrested for something? What? what? And he said, the majority leader and I want to talk to you about being a CIO here. We don't have one. We need one. And I said, are you kidding? The Senate doesn't even have technology. He said, oh, yeah, come on in and talk to me. So I did. I went in and I talked to him, and I heard this phenomenal story. And, and I heard this story that basically the CIO at the Senate is responsible for all this, has a huge budget, is responsible for all the systems that, that the Senate uses. And it turns out the Senate's not just 100 guys, people, men and women in the Senate chamber doing legislation. And it turns out they're not just the greatest deliberative body in the world. It turns out there's actually about 10,000 folks in the Senate, and they're spread all over the country. And they're doing all kinds of stuff, and they need all kinds of systems to support them, all the way down to cybersecurity and continuity of operations, you know, planning what to do in the event of a disaster in Washington, D.C. Remember the alternate war headquarters that I had to build at NATO? Look what I had to do at the Senate. This is an alternate war headquarters. Who would have thought that at the United States Senate, the CIO would be building deployable alternate war headquarters, communications vans, to support continuity of government and continuity of operations in the event of a disaster in Washington, D.C.? So it was high visibility, <laughs> highly political, was the United States Senate. But I had done something like this before at NATO. At NATO, I learned how to operate in a highly political, decentralized environment. So I was used to this. My life was this beforehand, right? You've got a boss, you've got a president, you know, you've got worker bees, he's got a vision, everybody works, we win the war, he's got a vision, everybody works, we make profit, company successful, hierarchical, right, very structured. United States Senate, there's a hundred of them. Each one of them's got their own idea, each one of them is their own boss, each one of them owns their own data, and oh, by the way, the blue ones want the red ones gone, and the red ones want the blue ones gone, and here I am, down here, and I'm supposed to provide something that they all agree on. How do you do that? How do you do that? in a highly politicized environment. 
You need a plan. You need a strategic plan. So we, we set out about writing the first IT strategic plan. Now here, I had a little bit different situation than I had at NATO. Senate was starved for something like this and embraced it and welcomed it. And we built a plan basically on five, five things, five strategic objectives, and here they are. And they had to do with you know, security and making systems more effective, you know, and, and, um, and working, about, you know, working on making it state of the art and, and you know, providing the senators effective things that would help them get their legislation done better. Real simple, lots of pictures, and it worked out real well. In fact, we ended up creating a whole new organization in the Senate dedicated to technology infusion and innovation. And we called it the Process Management and Innovation Center. And I brought a, a friend of mine who I had worked with in the Air Force and who I had worked with in industry, and I brought him to run that, and he's still running that. So the lesson to come from that is, you know, as you go through your career, um, starting now with the people in this room who are your friends who are helping you get through this ordeal, you know, make friends. Um, keep a little A list of people in your mind the people you want to continue to surround yourself with in your life as you go through your career. Um, and call on them, and, and they'll, they'll help you, and they'll help you succeed. So we created this whole new organization. We rolled out the strategic plan, and it was a way to get kind of everybody on board um, with, with, with what we were trying to do. The only way to be successful, remember Hansen's Law about the CIO coming up with ideas and they're not being embraced by the operational community? Well, the way to get past that at the Senate was through collaboration through outreach, through communication. So we built a CIO dashboard and a web page, and I built the first blog there, and, and put this stuff out, and, and involved the Senate staff in all this stuff, and got them to own it, and got them to want it, and got them to agree with it. And we set up a set of emerging technology conferences, and I think that's how Bob Rich and I actually originally met, um, somebody that I invited um, to come to one of our conferences and talk. And it was a friend of Bob's, and he talked to Bob about me, and Bob called me, and worked on me for about a year and a half and got me to come back here and, and start, you know, start interfacing with the university and I'm so glad he did. Um, but, but back to the network thing. But we set up this whole, this whole culture around outreach and around communication. And we built a customer satisfaction survey and I'll never forget when I first did it, my boss said, Greg, you sure you wanna do that? You might learn something you don't wanna know. You know I said, yeah, I do. I said, because even if I get a bad grade, at least I know how I'm doing. And I have something to build from and something to start with. So we did that. And we use that as feedback and, and kind of a, a, a motto of no surprises, right? The worst thing in the world is to be surprised. Um, we had a few, but we, we tried to minimize that. And then you're cooking along as a CIO of the United States Senate and everything's going fine and then something happens like you have a ricin attack or you have a hurricane. This is a, this is a little excerpt from a Hurricane Katrina report that we did. We had something like 11 offices that were destroyed. You know, we had the senator from Mississippi operating out of a van in a parking lot of a Walmart. Um, you know, you have to deal with stuff like that. Um, when they were doing the 9-11 report and they put the 9-11 report out, uh, guess what happened to my networks? Bam. All of a sudden, my networks were spiked and the senators were calling and saying, hey, what's the matter with our systems? You know, well, you guys just put this report out. Um, and so you have, to, you have to try to plan for stuff like this and deal with stuff like this. And then things come along that you're just not ready for, like, you know, the, the death of a president. Um, and, and one of the things I got to do while I was there was to be an assistant sergeant at arms which means in his absence or along with him, I got to do sergeant at arms things too, like escort presidents and work um, situations like inaugurations and when President Reagan was lying in state in the Capitol. And, and I got to participate in events like that, um, things that made it a much, much richer experience than just a typical government CIO job. And so that brings us to where we are today. I don't know how we're doing on time. We're about there. Um, so here's... Here's where this has all led. Now I'm doing business, I'm back, left the Senate after five years, um, had a wonderful time there, met more wonderful people, had a phenomenal team there, um, was one of the greatest experiences of my life and set me up to come back into industry. Um, and now I'm running um, a large part of a, of a fairly large publicly traded company and we're working with the federal government and it's challenging times right now. It's challenging times, right? The budgets are getting crushed. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of fear. Um, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of anxiety going on, and it's hard right now being a federal contractor, but I tell you who the folks are who still have the greatest job security in my company. It's the engineers. It's the guys who understand technology and understand math and understand engineering. Because when the government needs me to do a job and I win a contract, I don't have trouble finding administrative people, but I have trouble finding good engineers, and I have trouble finding good cyber technology people. 
And I have trouble finding good engineers who can communicate, who can speak, and who can write. And this is critical. So I've got two kids. Um, my son, I think I mentioned he graduated Virginia Tech in 2008 as a computer engineer. Went to work for a, for a big five company and he's doing great. My daughter went to Virginia Tech and she just graduated in May. And today's her birthday, by the way, so I'll give her a shout out. Um, she graduated Virginia Tech in May. She didn't take the engineering route because she saw Matthew, my son, suffer so much. She decided to take the business route, but she got a degree in information technology, business information technology. Not bad. A great degree. She came out of school in May. She started work in June for one of the big five. She started at a great salary. So the point is, this is the thing to be in. This is the thing to be doing. But the thing I always told both kids was, it doesn't matter if you're a genius. If you can't write well, and if you can't speak well, and if you can't communicate and articulate, you're never going anywhere. You're not going to get out of the dingy cubicle in the basement. So if you want to, you know, if, 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 there's nothing more magic than blending a technology, a human, engineering, science, math, analytical capability, ability to think and explore and solve problems. Combine that with the ability to really communicate, and you are golden. You can name, you, you can name your, your path. You can do whatever you want. It's huge. So if, if you don't learn anything else from me today, that's, that's something I would really like to leave you with. Um, this is the culture in my business, a culture of no surprises. Everybody develops business, so you know, everybody's responsible for helping us find new business and grow. And people take ownership in their business. They, you know, at, at all levels, from, from me on down, they're responsible for the success of their business. So they're getting leadership. They're getting to innovate, and they're responsible for their numbers. Um, I believe you sometimes have to make hard decisions, and in this environment, sometimes we have to make very hard decisions. You know, we, we recently had to lay off a few people. That's hard. Nobody likes doing that. But there's never a reason to treat people badly. I've learned, I've learned throughout my career that even though you have to make hard decisions, you don't have to treat people badly. You know, there, there's ways you can treat people and, and get through that. Embrace change or become irrelevant. I don't, know, I don't know if you've heard this before or not, but this matters now more than ever. And you know, if you think about all the things I've talked about, right, from academia to industry to military to industry to academia to, the, to Capitol Hill, you, you've got to be able to embrace change. If you can't embrace change, and, and change is happening faster all the time, by the way, um, you will become irrelevant. And I've talked about the power of strategic planning and staying flexible. One of the bullets that I haven't talked about as I've gone through here, but you've seen a couple times, says max options. Staying flexible. You know, you, you, hear, you hear financial guys, they say, diversify, diversify your portfolio. You know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, diversify your life. Maximize your options. Learn lots of stuff. Be good at lots of stuff. If this isn't working out, I can go do this. You know, if this isn't working out, I'll go do this because I can because I've built a skill set and I'm marketable. Maximize your options. And that's, that's the other thing. If, if, if I've tried to teach my kids two things, it's, you know, be, be good at engineering, but be good at communicating and maximize your options. Give yourself wiggle room, right? If this doesn't work out, I'll go do something else and I'll be successful. So I'm finished. These are the, the things I'd like to leave you with. These are some of the things that I've learned over the past 35 years in my career and in my life. The power of relationships. Um, the power of people, and the power of teams. I couldn't have done any of this except that I was surrounded by wonderful people, wonderful professors, wonderful parents, wonderful friends. You know, we get by with a little help from our friends. It's all about people. Everything is really about people. In the end, nothing else really matters. Not technology, nothing. Um, take a chance. Put yourself out there. Might, might turn out to be something kind of neat, like, like what happened at NATO for me. Hard work with flashes of inspiration, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. Innovation's born out of opportunity. You know, uh, it, people who innovate find an opportunity to do something that's useful, right? UCF stands for opportunity. That's the tagline, I think. I saw it on a bus as I was coming in here this morning. <laughs> that's cool. That's where innovation is born, out of opportunity. So look for them, look for opportunities. And, and you'll be able to innovate and you'll be able to lead. And you guys are the future. I've talked about discipline and the power of strategic planning. Everywhere I've ever been and written a strategic plan, it's, it's served us well. It's, it's been something, at least a structure or a framework to do things by and succeed. I've talked about diversifying and maximizing your options. The key to upward mobility, all the way back to that first assignment with B-52s, my commander said, if you want to move on to the next step and you want to be successful, succeed here now. Do the best you can at what you're doing here today and you'll, you'll be able to move on. Good leader, good communicator. 
Good innovator, good communicator. Good engineer, good communicator. Leaders sometimes make hard decisions, but never, there's never a reason, in my opinion, to treat people badly. And finally, I believe if, if every morning, if, if when the alarm clock goes off and, and I have to get out of bed, if it's not something fun and I don't want to do it, then I'm going to go find something else to do. Because guess what, guys? This hour you just spent in here with me, and I know you were forced to come in here. You, you can't get it back, right? I mean, you guys are young. But as you get older, you realize this more and more. Do what you love. Do what's fun. That doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't work hard. And, and I'm here to tell you engineering is hard. Engineering is really hard. But it will pay off. So um, I hope you're doing it. I hope you're having fun. Um, I hope I've imparted a few things that will help you. Um, as you go through the, the rest of your academic career here and, and as you go through your lives. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. <laughs> do I get to answer questions? How much time do you have? So we're sort of out of time. We do. So um, <laughs> that's way cool. So I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. And if you all have questions, catch them afterwards. Yeah, I'd love to take questions. So the first one is a very short answer. So you talk about strategic planning. Mm -hmm. So should we as individuals have a strategic plan? Should they have a strategic yes. plan? Yes, yes, I had a strategic plan. I don't know how I figured this out or when I figured it out, but at some point in my life, early in my life, it was about the time I was trying to get into that master's program, I figured out how I wanted my life to go. And here was my strategic plan for my life. The first 20 years from zero to 20 was to you know, be a good kid, get, get through high school, get through college, get an education. The second 20 years of my life, I decided I would dedicate the service to my country, to the, to, the, to the Air Force. I made a commitment when I went to the Air Force Academy that I would stay in the Air Force for 20 years. And it was part of my life strategic plan. Now, there was a lot of temptation to get out of the Air Force along the way. There were some challenges. And when I got my PhD here, my phone started ringing. And people in industry started saying, hey, man, come on out and we'll triple your salary. But, it wasn't in my plan. My plan was to give those 20 years to my country, and, 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 but to use those 20 years to grow and set myself up for the next 20 years. The third 20 years of my life, I planned to dedicate to industry. I wanted to do an Air Force career, develop myself as much as I could, and then I wanted to go into industry and, and try to serve in some capacity in industry. So the third 20 years of my life, age 40 through 60, I was going to be in industry, and, and, and it worked out pretty much exactly like I planned, except for that little five-year stint at the Senate, which, which was a wonderful, wonderful diversion, by the way. I, I, I'm so thankful for it. And then the fourth 20 years of my life, age 60 to 80, I was going to teach. I was going to be a, you know, a teacher and, and, try to, and try to share some of the things that I had learned and, and some of the things that I had gained um, with, with folks that, you know, that wanted to learn. So that was my life strategic plan, um, and, and this was how I did it. And it, I've sort of done it to some extent. Uh, now, I started the teaching early, and I've been teaching since 1988. Um, and, but that's just so I can keep my chops so that someday maybe I can teach. But yeah. Cool. So the second question. So what did you learn about leadership, innovation, teamwork from playing a musical instrument <laughs> and in the band? Oh, God. I learned, I learned that if you can strap on a guitar and stand in front of a pile of amplifiers, and play music real loud and get people to dance, that it's absolutely magic. There's nothing like it. Um, so leadership and innovation, I mean, that, that's sort of a form of leadership, I guess. If, I mean, if, if leadership is getting people to do what you want them to do and they're willingly doing it and they don't know that they're willingly doing it, if you can play music and get them to dance, then, then you're leading, I guess. Um, and innovating, you know, writing music is, is, is a form of innovation, I think. And I've written a few s silly songs and sold a few silly CDs. Um, and, and I just, uh, you know, I do that because I, I want to have other things in my life. You know, people will say, God, you're a CIO, you're a CTO. You must love to go home and play with computers at night. And no, I love to go home and play my guitar at night, you know. Um, so, so I guess writing songs is a little bit like innovation. But here's something else I learned. And here's something that's really that you guys know. I'm sure a lot of you are musicians. A lot of IT people and engineers are musicians. And that's because music is math, and math is music, and the two are really, they're really, they're really together, right? And, and music and math, as far as I know, are the only two universal languages, right? I mean, I went to Japan. One of those pictures back there was, was Ali and I presenting our research in Japan, and I couldn't read any of the road signs, but I could read the numbers. 
And when I heard music, I recognized the music. So there's only two universal languages, math and music, and music is math. So um, that, that I learned. It's kind of a funny answer. It's not really about leadership or innovation, but <laughs> However, music is magic. I thank you for them for joining today, starting your strategy early and coming to teach and getting us to dance. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very set much. me up. <laughs> thank you.